All right, top of the hour. Good morning. I'm Poppy Harlow. It is 10 a.m. Eastern, and not only is North Korea not intimidated by that stark and unscripted warning from President Trump, it put out a new and quite detailed warning of its own in response. A senior North Korean general says he's drawing up a plan to launch four medium-range missiles towards the U.S. territory of Guam, landing less than 25 miles off the coast. Now, supposedly, the plan will go to Kim Jong-un for his sign-off in just days. Days. Meantime, the war of words continues. North Korea's media calling the fire and fury threat from President Trump, quote, a load of nonsense from a leader they call, quote, bereft of reason. Now, they rule out dialogue saying that only absolute force can work. We have live coverage throughout the region. Let's begin, though, with Will Ripley, uh, who has been to Pyongyang more than a dozen times. He joins us from Beijing. Of course, China, a key player in all of this. Will, your assessment of this response from North Korea? Well, as we expected, Poppy, Pyongyang is really upping the ante in this war of words with Washington and specifically with President Trump. Instead of backing down, this statement dials up the rhetoric even further, personally insulting President Trump, saying that he lacks knowledge of the situation on the Korean Peninsula, uh, that he, you can't, he can't be reasoned with, that North Korea has to use absolute force in dealing with him. But also what really makes this different from North Korean threats, North Korean often threatens to attack U.S. territories they've threatened to attack Guam, they've threatened many times to attack and annihilate the United States in Washington. But to lay out such a detailed technical plan that's what makes this so unusual, saying we'll use the Hwasong-12 rockets, an intermediate range rocket that can travel uh, at least 2,300 miles, uh, putting Guam, which is only 2,100 miles from the Korean Peninsula, potentially within the striking range, saying that they'll fly these rockets up over Japan and put them down in the waters less than 20 miles from Guam. The fact that they're being so detailed here indicates that either, one, they're bluffing, uh, and this is all uh, written down in, in an attempt to kind of add bluster, but that they don't have any plan of following through, or they technically feel that they have the capability to do this and they feel so confident about it that they will put the plan on paper as almost a warning to Washington not to test uh, North Korea's resolve. Um, I will say this, Poppy, I've talked with North Korean officials as recently as a month and a half ago. All of these weapons in their arsenal that they are developing uh, are designed as a deterrent. Uh, they say that they do not want to use them, although they also say they're not afraid to use them. This entire investment in this huge arsenal is to keep Kim Jong-un in power and and the North Koreans know they are outgunned if they actually do start mm -hmm. some sort of a war with the United States. And uh, the end result would not be good for them. Will Ripley, thank you very much for that. Now to Guam. Our Ivan Watson is there. And Ivan, this is not the first time that, that Guam and the people of Guam have dealt with a threat. No, shortly after Kim Jong-un took office after the death of his father, the previous leader of North Korea, he made threats against Guam, which is the westernmost piece of American territory, also home to uh, several major uh, U.S. military installations. And after those threats came, the U.S. military deployed the THAAD missile defense system here, uh, which more recently has also been deployed in South Korea to help protect uh, that region, that country from ongoing threats coming from Pyongyang. So the governor of Guam, who I spoke with at length today, he insists that the threat level has not been increased in response to uh, the statement that Will described and showed to you there. Uh, he also pointed out that there's no panic on the streets or the beaches of this island. Take a listen. There's no panic in Guam. Uh, I'm sure you've talked to people who live in Seoul uh, or even Tokyo. I, I think the, the concerns are even more weighty over there, which is closer to the action, and particularly Seoul, where enemy artillery uh, is within range of, of the inhabitants of Seoul. There's concern here. People are concerned. They're instructing their kids what to do in the event that the emergency sirens go off. But I saw a lot of people swimming and snorkeling in the beach in the bay behind me today as well. Poppy? Ivan Watson, thank you for that perspective. It's important to be on the ground and talking to them there. We appreciate it live in Guam. Uh, South Korea, uh, for its part, is saying it is still open and ready for dialogue, diplomacy with its neighbor. Our Anna Corrin joins me now from Seoul with that. I mean, this has been the strategy of President Moon since he, since he was elected, and clearly the South Koreans are still hanging on to that. 
Yeah, it's quite incredible, isn't it, Poppy? I mean, South Koreans have been living with this threat for decades, and ever since President Moon Jae-in came into power earlier this year, he has opened the doors for dialogue with North Korea. Obviously, the North Koreans haven't taken him up on that offer, but he has persisted. Interestingly, however, there has been some sort of political shift uh, in the climate here in South Korea ever since uh, North Korea successfully tested that ICBM uh, at the end of last month. Uh, that's when President Moon, he reversed his decision to actually suspend uh, the THAAD missile defence system. Uh, and then there's also been a call uh, by political uh, conservative politicians, I should say, in this country for the reintroduction of America's tactical uh, nuclear weapon, something that was withdrawn from South Korea in the 1990s. So I definitely think it's fair to say that while South Koreans are very calm and, and cool and measured when it comes to threats from North Korea, uh, as far as the government is concerned, as far as uh, this president is concerned, whilst they're open to dialogue, they are also very aware that they need uh, to beef up their own defences um, because of that perceived threat from the North, Poppy. Mm -hmm. Right, and as Wilbur Flea report last hour, the U.S., South Korea will have those joint military exercises together uh, as well this month, the show Force to the North. Thank you very, very much from the reporting from Seoul. Joining us now, Kelsey Davenport, Director for Nonproliferation Policy at the Arms Control Association, an important voice today, of course, and Colonel Peter Mansour, former aide to General David Petraeus. Nice to have you both here, and Colonel. You said something interesting that I'd love for you to explain to our viewers. You say it's essential for President Trump, you believe, to put the military option on the table, front and center, like he is right now, for diplomacy to work. Explain. Well, that's exactly right. For two decades now, diplomacy has done nothing to halt the North Korean nuclear program or its missile development. You know, Henry Kissinger once said that diplomacy without the threat of force is like an orchestra without instruments. Mm. And in this case, unless Kim Jong-un believes that the military lever of power is actually on the table and that we would use it, he will just continue to do what he's doing in developing ICBMs and miniaturizing his nuclear warheads. So I actually think that in this case, uh, the threat of force is, can be uh, a valuable addition to our diplomacy, but it's got to be used very, very uh, delicately. Kelsey, you would disagree. I mean, you, you make the argument that diplomacy, that talks have worked. But if that's the case, why are we where we are now? Why has North Korea accelerated its development so much? Well, I think that what the White House really needs to be doing now is making a more concerted effort to send a direct signal to North Korea that it's willing to engage in talks. President Trump's threats, the fiery rhetoric, are just inviting North Korea to make additional threats of its own and increasing the chance of miscalculation. Now, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is talking about negotiations, and that's good. Mm -hmm. But when you have the Secretary of State make, making one message and you have threats coming from the president, it's difficult difficult for North Korea to know how to respond, and that increases the chance of miscalculation. But what about the lessons from history? I mean, it, it didn't work in the Clinton administration, in the Bush administration, in the Obama administration, because the program just carried on, uh, despite some brief pauses, and accelerated to where we are today, Kelsey. I think that's the core of my question, is who is to say that it will work when history has shown otherwise? Well, I disagree slightly about how diplomacy with North Korea has worked in the past. The United States negotiated bilaterally with North Korea in the 90s, and while that agreement did ultimately fall apart, it did halt North Korea's production of plutonium for nuclear weapons for a number of years. And multilateral talks with North Korea during the Bush administration you know, yielded similar results, a halt in the program. So I think that demonstrates that we can engage with North Korea in talks if there's a concerted effort, and that's what the Obama or what the Trump administration needs to be signaling now. I don't think the Obama administration made a concerted effort to try and engage with North Korea. They relied too much on sanctions to push North Korea to the table. And that's not a strategy and that's not going to work now. Colonel, do you agree with Kelsey? Diplomacy is still the way to have success here? Well, I would just point out that the agreed framework uh, that Clinton, uh, President Clinton negotiated fell apart. Uh, he said the, that. Talks, the talks that President Bush uh, entered into, that fell apart when North Korea detonated a nuclear device in 2006. Look, the only way to uh, end North Korea or freeze North Korea's nuclear program and missile 
program is to put enough pressure on them with all levers of power so that they come to the table in good faith. And that's what they have not done in the past two, two decades. What about the rhetoric that's, that's been used, Kelsey? I mean, the president using words akin to Truman after, though after the first atomic bomb was was dropped, fire and fury, unlike the world has ever seen before. We've learned uh, since he made those remarks, they were contemporaneous. These were sort of not passed by his team and they were all off, off the cuff. Your take? Well, it still sends a dangerous signal to North Korea that the United States is willing to escalate the rhetoric as North Korea escalates rhetoric of its own. You know, since Trump made those comments, North Korea has made a more specific threat than its usual level of threat toward Guam. Now, it's critical that the United States not respond by increasing the level of rhetoric further and look for options to de-escalate the situation. I mean, I, I certainly agree that there needs to be pressure on North Korea to get them to, to talk, but talk Talks and pressure need to go hand in hand. And right now there's a diplomacy deficit when it comes to outreach to North Korea. Kelsey, thank you very much. Colonel, thank you as well. We appreciate the perspective from both of you. I so President Trump has drawn his own red line. You heard it very clearly. The question now becomes this morning, what happens if North Korea crosses it? We're talking to a member, a Republican member of the Foreign Affairs Committee next. Also, he's the man President Trump needs to get his legislation through Congress that is not stopping him from taking direct aim in public at Mitch McConnell. And FBI agents now in Cuba after a bizarre attack on some U.S. Embassy employees, two diplomats facing serious hearing problems from what they're calling an acoustic attack. What exactly happened and could another country be involved? We'll take you live to Havana.